You know, one thing I've learned and I've been studying and, and just uh, diving into the Word a lot lately, which we always do, but there's something about God's Word that tends to make us uncomfortable. There's something about doctrine that, you know, when you read the Bible, it's not full of what God needs to do. It's full of what God will do, but it's full of what we need to do. And when you read what we need to do and what we need to change and what we need to rearrange in our personal lives, sometimes it tends to make us a little squirmish and uncomfortable. This is why, and you know, you've heard Pastor Mark say this several times before. You've heard how he says that ministers and churches have put the Holy Spirit in the back room, and I 100% agree with that. And I was meditating on that and praying about that, and the Holy Spirit just kind of spoke to me, and he said, they have put me in the back room, but the reason why they've put me in the back room is because they put Jesus there first. They've put the Word in the back room because it tends to make the sheep uncomfortable, so in the name of comfort, they've moved Jesus to the back room and they begin to fill the pulpit with things that appease the flesh, if you will. See, doctrine doesn't appease the flesh. Doctrine corrects the flesh. The Word of God doesn't make the flesh comfortable, it makes the flesh uncomfortable. And so what they've done is they begin to fill the pulpit with things that gratify the flesh, like politics. And when the pulpit gets filled with politics, what does it do? Well, it brings divide. Because once a minister gets political, you're dividing half your congregation. Because half believe it and half don't. They've filled the pulpit with things that make the people comfortable. And said, whoo, y'all, don't get, I said I need your help this morning. Hallelujah, don't abandon me now and leave me up here by myself. They've removed the word of God and therefore there's no growth in the church. The, the, the word of God will always motivate, inspire, and drive you to grow and be better. I did a series in the youth ministry. We did it for three weeks and it was called Do Better. <laughs> well, how do we do better? Well, first, we got to get better at yielding to God's word and to the Holy Spirit. And when he speaks something, instead of doing what the Apostle Paul said and kick against the pricks, we must say, okay, Lord, I see that and I adjust. But what I'm grateful for about our pastors in this church is we never put the word of God in the back room. And since the word of God and Pastor Mark and Pastor Ron a fight to keep doctrine, strong doctrine, and good word coming forth from this pulpit, and when that happens, now the Holy Spirit has something to move on. You know, the Holy Ghost doesn't move on our opinions. He doesn't move on what we, he moves on the word of God. And so if you want the Holy Spirit to move in your life, you need the word of God in your life. And as you have the word, you give him something to confirm and something to do because he is the confirmer of the word that is taught. Hallelujah. And so this morning, I want to talk about sticking with the word. I want to talk to you about fighting the good fight. Now, when we talk about fighting a good fight, and we're going to look at what the Apostle Paul wrote Timothy, we're going to look at what, we're not sure who the author was, but what they wrote the church, uh, uh, Hebrews, and what they wrote in Hebrews, we're going to look at all that stuff. And when we talk about holding and fighting the good fight of faith, lots of times we think about the faith, the Bible says God has put or dealt the measure of faith and put that in every man. And so right now you have the capacity to believe God. You have the capacity to trust God. And that's good, and we need to use our faith, and we need to stand on the promises that are given us to us in the Word. But it's not just about holding on to our faith that allows us to receive from God, but it's also about holding on to the faith. Our faith in Him. And that, that scripture that Pastor Belinda shared about the devil coming to steal, kill, and destroy, I believe that the author listed that in order by divine utterance from the Holy Spirit because before he can kill and destroy, he must steal something from you. And what I believe he must steal is the word of God. And once he's stolen the word out of your life, he can now move in and begin to kill and destroy because the only thing that keeps us protects us and watches over us is the word of God. Well, what is the word of God? Thy word is truth. 
Amen. What else is the word of God? He became flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So as you hold to the word, you're holding to Jesus. As you hold to the word, you're holding to the good shepherd. Amen. And everything the devil does, especially in the last days, y'all know we're in the last days. Amen. Let me tell you how far into the last days we are. You remember in the book of Acts when he stood up and he began to preach the very first sermon, what did he say? He said, this was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he began to speak of what the prophet Joel prophesied. The last days began in the book of Acts. And here we are. So we're in the last of the last days, right? And one thing that the devil has done from the very beginning is he's worked to divide God's people from the word. And we're going to look at it. It's true. Amen? We cannot get away from the word. So let's jump into it. Acts 20, 24, out of the King James Version, the Apostle Paul said, But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of our God. Someone say, none of these things. Come on, say, none of these things. We have to be like the Apostle Paul and dig in our hills. When you go and you read the book of Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, in chapter 11, I believe it is, the Apostle Paul goes off and he begins to list all the things that he suffered when it came to following after God. And there were many trials and tribulations and a lot of persecution that came to him, but the Apostle Paul said, I do not allow any of these things to move me. He said, you can stone me, I will not be moved from the gospel. You can beat me with rods, and I've been beaten three times. You will not move me from the gospel. I've been shipwrecked and floated adrift in the sea three times over. I've been hungry and I've been cold. But you will not move me from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to decide that we will not be moved. Since the Apostle Paul lived this, he was able to speak it to a young pastor by the name of Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 out of the NIV, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I want to read this little, uh, what Barnes notes on the Bibles as it breaks down this passage. And it says the following, I have fought a good fight. The Christian life is often often represented as a conflict or warfare. That noble conflict with sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Mm. That noble conflict with sin. Well, let's just, man, I, I, I don't have time to break down all these four. But don't you know the life of the believer is supposed to stay free from sin? Now, I've preached this many times, and I say this all the time. The Bible tells us, for who the Son sets free is free indeed. Jesus is the only one that can truly make us free. Hallelujah. But you know what? Once he sets you free, you have to determine in your heart that you're going to live free. And the way you live free is doing what James says, resist the devil. Hallelujah. And he will flee. Well, how does the devil come? He comes no other way but through sin. Hallelujah. And so we have to allow God to sanctify us with his word. We have to allow him to prune us with his word so we can continue to live free so we have the strength, the inner strength to resist sin. Amen. The next thing he said, noble conflict between sin. And then he said, noble conflict of staying free from the world. We can't let doctrines of man creep into the pulpit and into the church. We've got to stay free from the world. The next thing he said is a noble conflict with the flesh. Don't you know you have a flesh? I want to say this. You you don't have a sin nature problem. Shout out to Bible Institute in second year when we go through the in Christ realities. One thing we talk about is your new nature. Adam's nature, your sin nature has been removed from you. You no longer have a sin nature. That's not your problem anymore. What's your problem? We make bad decisions. (laughs) Amen. Amen. What's the problem? We're so used to yielding to the flesh that we have to break that cycle. You know, it doesn't matter how long you've been walking with God. You still have a flesh that you have to keep under. That's what the Apostle Paul said. I keep my flesh under. 
You know, just a couple weeks ago, we were blessed to go on vacation, and it's always wonderful to spend time with family. We were down at Destin, and there was a tropical storm that was coming, so we weren't allowed to go into the ocean and swim the waves, even though I wanted to. Man, I don't know what it is about those waves that could kill you, but it's just like, man, I bet I could beat that. You know, that looks challenging. I want to go out there and see what happens. But it's that what will happen that kept me from going out there. And so we weren't allowed to go. It was a double red. No one was allowed in the ocean. And so we decided we're going to go to this place called The Track and race go-karts. And uh, we had a wonderful time. You know, usually my son Samuel, he rides with me in the go-kart, but he's gotten big enough to where he wanted to drive himself. So much anxiety on my part. Y'all don't even understand. You know, and he's in front of me, and he's looking back at me driving the go-kart. I'm like, look forward! You're going to die! You know, look forward! And just the whole time, it was not a pleasurable experience for me. It was just high anxiety over and over and over again. As a parent, I've lost control. You know, he has taken the reins, and I can't deal with that. And so it was high anxiety, and, you know, uh, Christian, he didn't want to ride the go-kart, so him and Rachel were in the uh, arcade. And there's something about my youngest son. He has divine favor when it comes to the arcade. He won the jackpot like five times. We had something, I think it was like 15,000 coupons to redeem. 15,000! And he was just winning, and they were sending me text messages, another jackpot, another jackpot, another jackpot. Well, this was an unusual day at the track because nobody could go to the beach, so everybody came to the arcade. So it was highly dense in there, and there was so many people in there. And, and so after Samuel and I got done on the track, it started to rain, and since it was raining, everybody went into the building. So now there's even more people in the building. And Rachel and Christian, with their 15,000 tokens or whatever they had, they were standing in line to get to the desk uh, to purchase. And you know how it is, right? You spend, I don't know, 20 bucks getting all these tokens for a $3 plastic toy that's going to break when you get in the car. It's just such a good investment, <laughs> you know. But they had fun, and that's the most important thing. And so they're standing in this crowded room, and, you know, Samuel and I come in. And Samuel, you know, he doesn't really like crowds, and I get it. And so when we're in this crowded room, he's like, can we go to the car and wait? And so I was like, well, Rachel, why don't you take him to the car, and I'll take your place in line. And what am I talking about? That noble conflict with sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so I take Rachel's place. If y'all know my boo, she's little. And so she just, you know, if you're in a crowd of people, she's easy to miss. Samuel's as tall as she is now. It's five foot nothing. It just stops right there. Hallelujah. And so I take her place in line, and she takes Samuel, and they go out to the car. And the person in front of us, they get done. And then when I start to walk towards the counter, the guy behind me goes, you're not allowed to cut. And I was like, what you say? You know, who, I know you're not talking to me. So I turn around, and I'm like, Me? And, he's, and he looks at me and he goes, yeah, we've been waiting in line for 45 minutes. you got to go to the back of the line. You can't cut. Whew. Whew. And I, I believe this about myself, not being narcissistic or prideful, but I'm one of the most patient men you'll ever meet in your life. Why? Because I fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and it's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And he produces that in me, but it was just something about this that triggered me. Hallelujah. My wife's been standing here for 45 minutes, and I've taken her place and been standing here for 15 minutes. And so I looked at him, and I just started to lay into him. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. Y'all don't judge me. <laughs> don't judge. Act like you ain't got a flesh. You ever never said nothing you didn't regret. But I was like, you know, I just began to, I've been here for 45 minutes. I'm not going to the back of the line. So me and this man, we start off, and I could get away with this because I'm in Destin, Florida. You know what I mean? I'm a pastor in Alabama. Hallelujah. You don't go to our church. I don't know you. Let me set the record straight, young man. And so my flesh just come up out of nowhere. And I'm like, you go to the back of the line. I'm, I'm getting my stuff, hallelujah. And so we're arguing, and then all of a sudden I have this epiphany that my son's standing there looking at me like this. <laughs> Calm down, dad's getting it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm getting after him. Just leave me alone. <laughs> and just looking at me, and then I just, all of a sudden, I'm like, what kind of example do you want to set? And it's amazing, but then I'm like, yeah, but God... Yeah, but, and so I grab, and this is the way it always works. When you lose control and you yield to the flesh, 
it doesn't really hurt the person that triggered you. I grabbed my son by the arm and I said, let's go to the back of the line. And so I rip him and we went to the, and I start walking to the back of the line and the guy's like, well, you don't have to do that. He's like, that's a little bit over the top and don't you, you're just exact. And I'm like, dude, you're, you're just laying into me about this. It's fine. We're going to go to the back of the line. And Christian's like, but, but, but. And I'm like, we're going to the back of the line. So we went to the back of the line. We wait like another 30 minutes to get to the front of the line. What's my point? We have a flesh. And can I tell you why pastors and ministers minister from the pulpit things that gratify the flesh? Because we as human beings like to feed our flesh. You can build a crowd by feeding the flesh. And so we're waiting in line, and I don't know what happened. Well, I do know what happened because he told me. This guy, he walks up to me, and he said, I just want to apologize. My wife corrected me. <laughs> she said, she did see your wife standing there, and you didn't cut. You took her place. I wanted to lay into him again. <laughs> you right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Give me all your tokens. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> fix it. <laughs> and he came back, and he apologized. And I said, I really appreciate that. Now, let me apologize. I lost my cool. I said some things I shouldn't have said. And I apologize. I'm sorry. I don't know if we need to hug it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> whatever we got to do, if we need to shake hands or whatever. But listen to what he said. The Christian life is often represented as a conflict or warfare. That normal conflict with sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Paul now says, now this is key, he had been able to maintain. What does that mean? With all these conflicts, someone telling me I've cut in line, can I maintain the faith? With somebody attacking me and attacking my family, and I was right. I was right. How many times was the Apostle Paul stoned for being right? But yet he said, I maintained. I didn't let go. And you read those struggles. And one time they stoned him so bad they thought he was dead. So they put down their stones and left. And the Bible says, what did he do? He got up and went to the next town. He maintained. We have to maintain this life of faith. And then he said, I have kept the faith. I have steadfastly maintained the faith of the gospel. This, this isn't just for a preacher. This is a lifestyle. I have steadfastly maintained the faith of the gospel, or I have lived a life, here we go, of fidelity to my master. I have lived a life of fidelity to my master. Probably the expression means that he had kept his plighted faith to the Redeemer or had spent a life in faithfully endeavoring to serve his Lord. How many people leave their Redeemer because something sounds more appealing? How many people leave the faith because something is spoken from God's word that challenges them and instead of rising to that challenge, they turn and they leave? Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that is promised. Now, this is written to the Hebrews, and what we may not know oftentimes is they were being persecuted. This church was suffering great persecution, and it wasn't just coming from outsider. The, the, the Christian church in the early days was made up of a lot of people, but at the beginning, it was mostly made up of Jewish people that have left Judaism and came over to Christianity. And so they were being attacked by fellow Jews. But he said, just because you're being attacked, and what the world is doing today is attacking the gospel. Long before any issues became political, they were biblical. The Bible has a lot to say about sex. And before it became a political issue, God said how it's supposed to be. 
before gender became political, the Bible said something in the very beginning. But what the world loves to do is they take these biblical issues and they make them political so ministers will draw back from them. See, but we cannot draw back from these things. We have to get the truth and we have to hold fast. Oh, come on now. Don't shout me down. The devil hates the word. And he hates you. But you can't let go of the word. 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life, which were you called, which you made a good, a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We know what was going on with Timothy. There was political upheaval and Nero had burned the town and he blamed the Christians and so they were all leaving the church of Ephesus. But the Apostle Paul, from prison, <laughs> from prison, writes him and says, do not abandon the faith. Fight the good fight of faith. It doesn't matter what persecute, it doesn't matter if you're facing persecution on biblical issues, you hold tight. You hold, and what does the Bible say in Ephesians? I believe it is. It says, hold to the truth in love. I'm not drawn back from the truth. You know where the mistake is usually made is Christians hold to the truth, but they don't do it in love. Holding a sign condemning somebody to hell for their lifestyle does not help them. That is not holding the truth in love. But why are we persecuted for these things? Persecution comes for a number of reasons. The two reasons I believe it comes mostly is to get us to draw back. In our personal lives. You know, if individuals begin to rise up and persecute me for the way I'm raising my children, because the Bible says raise them up in the things of the Lord, and when they're older, they will not part from them. If I get persecuted about that, I'm not drawn back. Because my children's lives are on the line. What did he say in Deuteronomy 30, 19? He said, I've placed before you life and death. Now choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Amen. See, if you draw back from this, it doesn't just affect you. Oh, I'll say that again. <laughs> if you draw back from this, it doesn't just affect you. It affects your descendants and how they're going to live when they're grown. And then how their ch Pastor Rhonda, she just taught us on this two weeks about legacy. See, we have an obligation to put the hands of our children into the hands of God. And you can't do that if you draw away. <sighs> the things that are going on these days, you cannot draw back. I was reading the Washington Post and an article I read in there was Unbelievable unbelievable about how this this lady and her wife were living their life but it, I don't care about that but it's what they were doing with their children and how she was openly bragging about it when we draw back from God listen I've been in youth ministry for 19 years. I've been over to young adults ministry, I think, for two or three years now. I deal with the younger generation all the time. All the time. I see the challenges that they face. And one reason, not the entire reason, listen to me now. I'm not saying this so anybody will feel bad in the room. But one reason when they leave the home and they fail so miserable is because parents have not done a good job of doing what the Word of God says, where it says, hang these truths around their neck. See, because if they leave your home and they go to college, they're going to get something that is unfiltered. We've slipped into a generation where educators are no longer educators, but they've slipped over into activism. And they actively teach whatever their bias is towards, good or bad. What is going to hold your children from 
from that pulling them down because you've hung these truths around their neck. Now, I'll just tell you, when I was praying about this several weeks ago, my wife can attest to this. I told the Lord, no, I don't want to. Because I like the happy messages where we, jam, you know, we, woo, we're just wild and we're crazy and we're having fun. And I get up here and we talk and everybody's smiling. But guess what? Doctrine is not easy. I'll move on after I say this. If you don't educate your children, someone will. So persecution comes to get us to draw back. Next, it comes to get us to change our position. We see ministers doing this now. Well, maybe the church does need to revisit this. Maybe we do need to look at this differently. Well, what does the Word say? The Word doesn't say look at it differently. It says look at it through the Word. What does the Word say about it? Well, then that's how you look at it. Amen. This is what the devil loves to do. He loves to attack the believer so that they will struggle. But guess what? We overcome because God is faithful. When we hold fast to our faith in Jesus Christ, we win every time. I said we win every time. Can I get an amen? amen. Hebrews 10, 29 says this. We do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed. See, this is what happens when you shrink back. When you fail to hold to God's word and hold to faith, he says, when you draw back, you are destroyed. But we are of those who have faith and are saved. 1 Timothy 6.20, reading in 20 and 21, he says, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Now, I know he's speaking to a pastor, but let me ask you, what has God entrusted to your care? Your children, your ministry, your life. Guard, what, and how do you guard it? You hold to the truth. You hold to the word of God. Guard what has been entrusted to you. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. Ooh, you get it now, Paul. Just get after it. Opposing ideas that are falsely called knowledge. The King James Version says opposing ideas that are falsely called science. Hallelujah. Which some has professed and in doing so have departed from the faith. We have to hold true to the word of God. I want to read this from Ravi Zacharias. Listen to this. Being a Christian isn't just accepting Christ as Savior, but it is also being willing to reject everything that is contrary to him. I'll read it again. Being a Christian isn't just accepting Christ as Savior, but it is also being willing to reject everything that is contrary to him. I reject everything that is contrary to him. Now you can do that without hating people. You can do that, and this is what I call the complexity of a Christian life. Loving Jesus and rejecting everything that is contrary to him, but yet making a difference and an impact in the world. See, we don't reject everything that's contrary to him so we can look arrogant or be prideful. We don't reject everything that is contrary to him so we can have a more holier than thou look down our nose at people. We don't reject everything that is contrary to him so we can set ourselves above others. We set ourselves, uh, we reject everything that's contrary to him so we can live a life of fidelity to our faith. A life of fidelity to our Redeemer and to our Savior. 1 Timothy 1.18, 19 out of the Baron Study Bible says, Timothy, my child, I entrust you with this command, keeping with the previous prophecies about you, so that, the, so that by them you may fight the good fight of faith, holding on to faith and good conscience, which some have rejected, thereby shipwrecked their faith. See, when we abandon the truth, we shipwreck our faith. And many ministers, I'm sorry to say, now there's a lot of good ministers out there, so I'm obviously not balkanizing or painting with a broad brush, but I'm saying there's a lot of ministers out there who have left the faith and are preaching other things that are contrary to God's word, and not only have they shipwrecked their faith, they're shipwrecking whole congregations. 
Because faith comes by hearing and hearing a word. It's what it says in Romans 10, 17. So when a minister abandons the word, faith can no longer grow in the congregation. We cannot abandon what's been entrusted to us. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Everyone say, I will offer. Offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your good and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. I believe one or two things are always happening in our life. We're either conforming or we're being transformed. I don't believe that there's any neutral ground when it comes to the lifestyle of a Christian. I believe you're doing one or the other. You're either, it's awful quiet in here this morning, hallelujah. <laughs> you're either conforming or you're transforming. We have to decide in our hearts, we will do whatever we have to do not to conform. I will do whatever I have to do to be transformed by the word of God. I want to read this parable by a Jewish writer, Eli Wessel. He wrote this, one just man came to Sodom, determined to save its inhabitants from the sin and punishment. Night and day he walked the streets and the markets, protesting agreed against greed, theft, falsehood, and indifference. In the beginning, the people listened and smiled ironically. Then they stopped listening, and he no longer even amused them. The killers went on killing. The wise kept silent, as if there was no just man in their midst. One day, a child, moved by compassion for the unfortunate teacher, approached him with these words. Poor stranger, you shout, you scream. Don't you see that it is hopeless? Yes, I see, answered the just man. Why do you go on? I tell you why. In the beginning, I thought I can change man. Today, I know I cannot. If I still shout today, if I still scream, it is to prevent man from ultimately changing me. Let us hold to the truth. Hallelujah. Let us profess it before a cloud of witnesses. Let us not draw back. Some will hear and some will be changed. Some will hear and they will scoff. Some will hear and they will mock. But let us not change. Let us do whatever we have to do so that we don't conform, but we are transformed. Go over to Genesis chapter 3. Y'all doing all right this morning? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Now we know this. <laughs> now the serpent, who was the shrewdest of all creatures the Lord God had made, Really, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit of the garden? Listen to me. When the devil comes and he challenges you, when it comes to the word of God, what do you do? You scream it and you yell it. This is where she made, she made a plethora of mistakes. Hallelujah. We know that Adam made the first mistake. He didn't guard the garden and keep the serpent out. We're not going to get into that. But this is one of the first mistakes she made. She entertained When you entertain the devil, you're giving him an opening that is supposed to remain shut. And like Jesse Duplantis says, if you don't embarrass sin, sin will embarrass you. Of course you may eat it, the woman told, or of course we may eat it, the woman said. It's only the fruit from the tree of the center of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God says we must not eat it or even touch it or we'll die. You won't die, the serpent hissed. God knows that your eyes will be open. And when you eat it, you'll become like God, knowing everything, both good and evil. The woman was convinced. Now, let me just go right here. And you can see a lot of problems and societal issues that we're facing. It comes back to this very simple truth. Woman was not satisfied with God's creation. If she was satisfied with his design and his creation, she would have never sat and entertained the thought, I can be better if I do it your way. When humanity becomes dissatisfied with God's design, there's no lengths they won't go to to change it. Even if it means getting in bed with a serpent. This is why we, uh, hallelujah. This is why we see people having lifestyle 
change in surgeries, to alter God's design. Because they think their happiness and their joy would be different if they were different. And so they're not satisfied with what he created and what he's made. And they say, I know I'll be satisfied if I just change. And so they change. And then we have data upon data upon data on how that change torments and destroys the life. When you move away from God's design, listen to this. The moment we become unsatisfied with God's plan and God's design is the moment that compromise begins. Now this could be true about every, what's your career that God's called you to? What's the ministry he's called you to? He's called you to be a mother or a father. What's he called you to? The moment you become frustrated with his design is the moment you begin to compromise. See, in the garden, they didn't just want to know good. That was God's design, that mankind would only know good, but they wanted to know good and evil. What did the Apostle Paul tell Timothy, which some people call knowledge? Some will say, that's good teaching. Mm, Hallelujah. They moved away from the word, and it caused great turmoil in their lives. Anytime we had Dr. Mackins, if you could, uh, I left it down there because I didn't have anywhere to put it, but there's two things of Plato right there on that front chair. If you just throw me one of those, it doesn't matter which one, whichever one's your favorite color. (laughs) The good doctor likes pink. Hallelujah. I want to read this scripture to you, Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. Hallelujah. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down, to the, uh, go down at once to the potter's house, and there I will reveal my message to you. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the vessel he was shaping from the clay became flawed. Now, we could spend time there, but we're not going to. Became flawed in his hand. So he formed it into another vessel. Now, this is key as it seemed best for him to do. The word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, can I not treat you as this potter treats his clay? Just like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Now I want to say this. There's many potters in this world, but there's only one true potter. And our lives are like this Plato. They're very flexible and could be molded and shaped. And, and I have this problem where I cannot get it out of here because it's stuck on the inside. So I'll just get a portion of it. Leave the rest in there. But this clay, this Play-Doh in my hands can be shaped into whatever I design it into. Now, because I'm not very creative or artistic, I can just make a ball. <laughs> but you know what? If I gave this Play-Doh to Mr. Ollie down here, maybe he can make it into a star. See, your life is like Plato, or as this scripture calls it, clay in the potter's hand. If you guys have that upstairs, throw that image up there for me. My son Samuel, with the help of my wonderful wife, Rachel, made this for a school project this year out of Plato. It's the human digestive. I could never make that, <laughs> by the way. But it's the throat, the esophagus, the stomach, the intestines. It's, that's all made from Plato. See, they saw something, and they took the Plato, and then they begin to shape it and form it and mold it. See, look at this. I made a pancake. <laughs> I'm brilliant. <laughs> but you notice what's key about that scripture. Listen, he said, uh, became flawed in his hand, so he formed it in another vessel, as it seemed best for him to do. See, Whoever we give our clay to, they're going to shape it into whatever seems best for them to do. (laughs) Hallelujah. Why is all of this important? Well, it's important because you need the hand of God 
on your life. And when you give your vessel to something that is not God, when you leave the faith and you say, I'm going to give my clay to someone or something, a different ideology, a different philosophy, a different doctrine, a different movement, I'm going to give my life to that. What happens then? You are now being shaped and formed according to what they think is best for your life. Can I just tell you this? The only one who knows what is best for our life is the real potter. He is the only one that knows what is going to work every single time. He's the only one that knows what's really going to make us happy and lead us to prosperity. He is the only one. And when we give him our lives and we let him shape it and let him mold it. And in Matthew 6, 33, as ye seek ye first, then all of these things can be added to you. Lots of times why we don't experience everything that he has for us is because we've given our lives to a different potter. And now they're shaping it and they're molding it into something that doesn't look like what it was supposed to be just as the devil did with Adam and Eve. We've got to hold tight to this. This whole series, you know, I was, or this message I was praying and reading and the Lord said, go read the book of Nehemiah. So I went and I read the book of Nehemiah. And there's parts of Nehemiah where it's just like names after names after names. But at the beginning of Nehemiah, you see something happening. What God can do on our lives, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 8. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me. Because the gracious hand of my God was upon me. See, it was very unusual for the Persian king to give access to a Jewish man to leave and go back and rebuild a city that they had, see, but Persia had controlled Jerusalem for a long time. But yet, here's this Jewish man, and he says, let me go rebuild the walls. Now, why would the Persian king let him go fortify a city that he wanted to control? Why would the Persian king let somebody from a different... And and, and Nehemiah was important to the king. He was his cupbearer. He tested the drink to make sure... What a job. He tested the drink to make sure there was no poison so the king would live. How much trust did that king have in Nehemiah? Which is amazing on its face. He didn't choose another Persian. He chose a Jewish man. Why? Because the hand of God was upon me. Everything we talked about this morning, let's bring it together with this final thought. We fight the good fight of faith to keep the hand of God on our lives. In Nehemiah 2.10 out of the NIV, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. Fight the good fight of faith. Keep the hand of God on you, and as you do, you will have good success. 